it's really a pleasure to have our first investment masterclass. Now, it's not really the first, because Pit Fulion, this will be his third presentation, and long may they continue, Pit. Uh, Pit is, is, is a f I regard him as a good friend. Uh, he's been a counsel, he's been an advisor, not on financial matters, on, on much more important stuff like introducing me to Berkshire Hathaway. In fact, introducing South Africans to Berkshire Hathaway. Now, of course, everyone knows Warren Buffett and quotes Warren Buffett and tells you what Baron Warren Buffett thinks and says. But when Pitt first started taking South Africans there, no one, people would have said to you, Warren, who? He's also South Africa's, this is important, top performing fund manager over the last five years. Thank you, Norman. You know, if you were Benjamin Zander, you would have stood up and given a good cheer. But I, I say this very, very uh, uh, advisedly because about three years ago, I remember talking to Pitt when some publications were writing horrific articles about Pitt and his performance and saying, this guy needs to be retired and take your money away and put it somewhere else. And now look at it. Now he's the top performing manager, which shows you, as Pitt has told us for the 30-odd years that we've known each other, that investing is a long-term game. So that's the only part of his presentation that I'm going to steal. I'm now going to hand over to the founder of ReCM, the partnership now with CounterPoint in their new company, my friend and your most popular of your presenters, Pitt Trillion. Thank you all for being here and not out on the golf course or the mountain biking trails, which are beautiful. So this has been incorrectly labeled a masterclass. Um, I prefer to call it a chat about investing. A lot of what I'm going to say is probably mothered and apple pie to, to many of you. But hopefully <clears throat> some of the things will stick and some of the things will remind you of what we're trying to do as we invest our money and as I do our clients' money. Uh, and as I was writing down the notes for this talk, even some of the things I thought of to speak about were things that I had not forgotten about, but I needed to remind myself about these things every now and then. So, so I'm, I'm going to go through my chat about value investing, uh, and hopefully different aspects of what I'm saying will resonate with different people here, but hopefully everybody will come away with something. And then I think we're going to leave a lot of time for Q&A, and then you can AMA, as I say on Twitter, ask me anything. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about value investing, but I think a good introduction to investing in general is a little joke Warren Buffett told once. Uh, it was about an oil speculator who died and went to heaven. And at the pearly gates, St. Peter was standing there uh, saying, what's your name? And the guy said his name, and what's your occupation? No, I'm, a, uh, I'm an oil speculator. St. Peter turns around and looks behind him and says, no, you know, we're full up here. No more room for any oil speculators. And the guy stands there, thinks for a couple of minutes, and he says, just give me a second. And he leans in through the gate and shouts, oil discovered in hell. And all the guys rush out, drop down to hell where they think they're going to find some oil. St. Peter says, that's, that's amazing. We've got lots of room in the inn for you now. Come on in. There's place for you. And the guy says, hang on, let me think about this for a second. You know what? There might be some truth in that rumor. I'm also going down to hell. <laughs> And I think that describes us all, that describes the human condition, that describes all of us. We are herd animals, and we are, even worse, emotional herd animals. So what value investing and growth investing, because uh, neither is right or wrong, it's just different ways of doing things. What these investment philosophies and processes are trying to do is trying to put in place a framework, a process, within which we can combat our natural tendencies to follow the herd, our natural ten tendencies to become emotional about investments. That is what an investment philosophy and process is all about. It's not, it's not a, a term meaning anything other than a philosophy and process which you put in place to protect yourself against yourself. 
So to understand how such a philosophy and process should work, I think we should start at the beginning. What is the value of an asset? Some people will say, well, it's whatever somebody else is prepared to pay for it. Other people will say, whatever the stock market quotation is. Other people will say, well, you know, whatever somebody tells me it is. But the exact definition of the value of any investment, whether that's your investment property, sorry, those two words don't belong together, but forgive me for that. Whether it's a share in a business, whether it's a Bitcoin and whether or a gold, uh, a gold coin. The value of an asset is the present value, in other words, the value in today's money of all the future cash flows it will generate for you, discounted back by some sort of interest rate. Now, this is not, this is not higher maths. It's, it's a simple equation. Cash flows in the future, discounted by interest rate, because remember, if you earn 100 Rand a year from now, in today's, if, and if your interest rate is 10%, in today's terms, it's worth 90 Rand. You've discounted by 10%. It's cost of time. All those future cash flows discounted back to today's money in using some sort of interest rate. That is the value of an asset. It's very simple. But it helps us understand how value investing goes about doing what it does and how growth investing will go about, will, goes about doing what it does. So we understand that. We can contrast value with growth, because that also helps to understand value investing. Growth investors are the popular guys at the party. They're out there at the braai, everybody around them, t telling jokes, everybody's hanging on their lips. It's fun. It's a good time. Growth investors, like forecasting, have a skill, and so the good growth investors have a skill in identifying businesses with strong and growing cash flows. And they are optimistic about forecasting those cash flows. That is the skill of a growth investor. A good growth investor can do that skillfully. Growth investors also have very high expectations, which is another way of saying they use a low discount rate when they discount those future cash flows back to present values. Because they are fairly certain about these cash flows. They have high expectations about these cash flows. Contrast that to value investors. Value investors, that's the guy in the kitchen of the party. Nobody's talking to him, to him or her. Uh, they don't want to talk to those people. They're saying funny things, and they're saying things that people don't believe, and it's not funny in any case, so nobody wants to talk to them. Uh, they don't really believe in very much, especially not the future. They don't know a lot, and they have very low expectations. So whatever cash flows they think an asset will generate, they use a quite a high discount rate to discount those cash flows back to present value. So that's the difference between the two types of investors. So I'm going to focus on the value investing style and philosophy and process, because that's what I practice in the funds that I manage. And hopefully in front of you, you'll have a fact sheet of, of the value fund that I do manage. Um, so the philosophy and process behind value investing, how does it work? Well, the father of value investing, Ben Graham, who wrote a couple of fantastic books, and if anybody's looking for a good book to read, Introduction to Value Investing, An Intelligent Investor, or The Intelligent Investor is, is a good book to read, written by Ben Graham a lot of years ago. I forget now how many, but a lot of years ago. And Ben Graham said in that book, his definition of investing is an activity which uh, uh, entails an analysis of an asset, and upon analysis promises safety of principle and a satisfactory return. So you can already see it. There's a couple elements here. Analysis, you have to do your analysis. You can't just listen to your mate at the braai. And your expectations are set low. He's talking about what you want is safety of principle, and a satisfactory return. He's not trying to shoot the lights out here. He's not trying to double and triple his money next year. He wants to conserve his capital, his principal, and he wants to earn a satisfactory return on that. That is the definition of investing as practiced by value investors. 
Warren Buffett, Ben Graham's disciple, so to speak, um, elaborated further on what value investors should do. He said there's two rules to investing. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. And as you see, you know, value investing is all about simple stuff. But in applying these simple things, sometimes can get complicated. But what Warren Buffett is talking about very, um, very simply was you have to manage your risk. In any investment process and philosophy, risk management has to be central in that process. Because when you invest, whether you are buying the bluest blue chip or the stinkiest small cap, you are taking on risk. And you have to manage that risk. Just because you're buying a so-called blue chip share doesn't mean this is a risk-free activity. There are risks attached to any asset. Any investment has risks attached to it. You know, I think one of the, as an aside, uh, you know, uh, up until about pre-pandemic, pre-March 2000, 2020, one of the safest investments is seen as student housing. You buy a bunch of flats in Stanley Bosch and you've got guaranteed rental forever. And people were paying lots of money for Stanley Bosch apartments because they knew the students would come back and rent from them year after year after year after year. And then all of a sudden, out the blue, a pandemic happens, and students are still, a lot of them still not even going back. Three years later, not going back to varsity. So any investment has risk attached to it. And your job as an investor is to manage that risk. So what do we do in terms of value investing? We analyze companies. We read the financial statements. We try to understand the financial statements, although IFRS makes it very difficult for us, but we try and understand the financial statements. Any accountants here will understand that inside joke. And we try and take those financial statements and put it next to the business and understand whatever the business management is saying about the business, whether that is reflected in the numbers or not. And then we try and look for idiosyncrasies or discrepancies to disprove our thesis, because that's what we try and do. We, you know, we're not scientists by any stretch of the imagination, but we come up with an investment proposition and we try and disprove that proposition, like scientists try and disprove their hypotheses. And that's analysis, and that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, but you have to do that to understand what you're getting involved with. But that's not the end of it. Warren Buffett told us we need to manage our risks, so how do we do that? Well, it's not with fancy computer programs, calculating value at risk numbers and all sorts of statistical correlations and coefficients and things. Uh, those things blow up over time. They've been proven not to work. When they need to work, they've been proven not to work. Very simply, what we do in, uh, in, to manage investment risk is we build a portfolio of assets. So we don't go out there and try and, try and identify the best share and put all our money into that one share. As I pointed out, every investment has risk attached to it. So we build a portfolio of assets to manage the idiosyncratic business risk of one company being a Steinhoff or something else, which very few people would have guessed. But in building that portfolio, we take into consideration certain aspects. The first thing we look at is the nature of the business. And if the business is risky, will have a smaller position than otherwise. And if it's a less risky business with contractual cash flows, we'll probably have a bigger position. But any single position will never be big enough to cause mortal damage to the portfolio. So position sizing is the key risk management tool that we use in managing a portfolio of value assets, undervalued assets. The other thing we try and do as far as we can, which in the South African market is, is hard, but we try and buy assets that are not highly correlated, where the investment outcomes are not reliant on the same factors. For instance, and we talk about this share, um, one of the shares in the counterpoint value fund is a company called Rebosis. Rebosis A share is trading at, at probably 25% of book value right now. There's a transaction on the table which hasn't been consummated. There's still some CPs outstanding. 
but if that transaction goes through, they would have sold half their portfolio for a slight premium to book value, and it's trading at 25% of book value. But there's all sorts of problems in that company. <coughs> that transaction might not happen, but we don't know that right now. So for me, that's quite a risky proposition. If the transaction happens, it's probably worth 10 Rand a share. If it doesn't happen, that thing's going to blow 50 cents. It's trading at, I don't know, 3 Rand at the moment. So what position size do you do? Well, a pretty small one, I'd say. You know, if, if you stand a chance of losing 75% of your principal, you're not going to put a lot, of money, a lot of money into that. So position sizing is key, and then uh, uh, and, and the correlation. Uh, so the outcome on rebosis is transaction dependent. It's not really dependent on the fundamentals of the property market. That thing is so deeply discounted relative to the properties it owns. The value extraction is all dependent on the transaction happening. So you can put that in the portfolio along with another company where the outcome is dependent on, say, the commodity cycle. And you know they're not correlated with each other. So you have diversification happening in the portfolio. That's the other risk management tool is diversification. So there we are. That's value investing in a nutshell. Safety of principle, satisfactory return upon analysis with risk management overlaid. So just allow me to talk about some aspects of investing which I regard as quite important from a value, again, from a value investing point of view. Very quickly, I see I've got five minutes left. Um, five minutes, five items. Number one, examine your mistakes. Don't, uh, your winners are fine, but when you're doing a review of your activities over the year, of the quarter, of the six months, rub your nose in your mistakes. Analyze them because that's where the learning sits. And the mistakes are normally along the vectors of either hubris, where things have been going well for so long that you neglect to do the work, or it's because you become stuck in a rut and you can't change your mind, you can't change your point of view, which is key in investing because the market is a smart weighing mechanism. Things change over time as prices change. And just because one thing has worked for such a long time is no guarantee that it will work in the future because the pricing has changed and the pricing changes human behavior. And human behavior changes the value of an asset. So you have to be able to change your mind. And the third thing is patience. The third type of mistake one makes is one running out of patience. Because investing is, as Alex pointed out, a long-term game. So mistakes, key to analyze. The second Thing, activity I think we need to do or implement uh, with discipline as investors is to write down our thoughts, to write what you're thinking about when you're making an investment decision. Because you might think when you're sitting there staring at the wall that you've got it all worked out in your head. Until you start writing down your investment thesis, then you will find all sorts of holes, all sorts of things you never thought about. But it's hard work, but it's probably the most valuable investment tool you can have, is to write down your reasons for buying or selling an asset. Um, uh, the third thing I think we all need to do as investors is to build a group of people that can act as sounding boards. Because I think some of the biggest mistakes you can make and it is when you sit there alone in the room uh, and I think Pascal said this a long time ago. All, and I'm misquoting him dramatically, but it, something along the lines of all human misery comes from not being able to sit, al sit alone in a room. Well, investors need to get out there. You can't sit alone in the room. You need to develop a group of people you can talk to about investment ideas that can act as sounding boards because you can't think of everything. And I found it most useful you know, working in a company like CounterPoint, to have other investors around me there to talk to them about what's happening in the markets, what ideas they have, what ideas do I have, how sensible, how stupid are these ideas. That's quite useful. But when you make the decision, you take full responsibility for this. It's not somebody else's fault. 
if it goes wrong. You made the decision, you take full accountability. You know, the stuff our government can't do, that's what you need to do as an investor. You take full accountability, despite having spoken to hundreds of people maybe, um, you make the decision and you live and die by that decision. Accountability is key because then it's only when you take accountability that you can then at some, po at some point in the future review your mistakes honestly. If you're sitting there blaming all the other people around you for this investment mistake, sorry, you've learned nothing. So I think those are the three, three key facts, um, that are general facts that I think one needs to try and implement into your investment philosophy and investment process which would, make it a, which would give you a more sensible outcome over time. Uh, a satisfactory return in your principle. So I think those are some opening remarks. Um, I think we can uh, get some questions. Uh, I'm happy to talk about stocks, ideas, markets, that sort of stuff as well. So please feel free to fire away.